chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. God restores my soul and leads me in the right paths for the Lord's name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your stamp, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Second reading, book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought, brought out on all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thieves come only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may be, have life and have it abundantly. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In both of our scriptures today, we hear about shepherds. In John 10, Jesus fulfills the hope of Israel for a good shepherd. King David was the shepherd king and the coming Messiah was promised to gather the lambs with his arm and gently lead those that are with young. God would provide protection and identity. The lectionary passage is cut short, so after Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, and I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. He says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. In Psalm 23, which we've heard a few times this morning, the choir, that was so beautiful. I'm still so moved from that. We hear God-given female pronouns, perhaps especially significant on Mother's Day. I wonder today if the mother and shepherd archetypes have much in common. With the question of who is the good shepherd? On Mother's Day, I am reminded of English pediatrician and psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott's theory of the good enough mother, or caregiver, who meets the most basic needs of a developing child so that the infant develops object permanence and eventually a sense of true self 
or ego integrity. Object permanence means that when the parent or caregiver leaves the room or the infant covers their eyes, the infant learns that the mother still exists when she leaves the room, even though the infant can't see her. Not much extra momming is needed for this, he claims, but basic conscious and unconscious physical and emotional attunement to the child, being around it. This alleviates some of the pressures of motherhood to do everything perfectly. So I wonder, who is the good enough shepherd? If you recall, in the Gospel of Luke, the story we often tell on Christmas, the angels announce the coming birth of Jesus first to a group of shepherds in the region nearby. Why do the angels come to the shepherds? What is significant about the shepherds? Out of all of the people in the region, the shepherds were the ones awake at night. Some of the special effects described in the story could only be experienced at night. The story says, a great light shone in the darkness. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angels or messengers told the shepherds to not be afraid, for a savior will be born. The shepherds, already a nomadic bunch, are able to say, let's go now, right now, to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known. The shepherds are the first group of people to get up and go to Jesus. Many people in the Gospels after this leave their families and professions to follow Jesus, but the shepherds were the first to go looking for this child wrapped in a band of cloth, lying in a manger. Shepherds watch their flock by night and are physically mobile. I had an experience in New York City with the initiates that felt like keeping watch over my flock at night. <laughs> First of all, I couldn't get a wink of sleep. I felt responsible for the well-being of eight teenagers and sometimes two adults in a strange city that I was familiar with, and they weren't. At night, I wondered, would the kids escape into the streets? Would they explore the church and get hurt? Is anyone sick or afraid? In the morning, the worship service we went to did not start until 11 a.m., so we went to breakfast. When we were sitting at the table, I began to feel this tangible presence of the Holy Spirit, a little bit of nerves and anticipation. What is this, I thought. I looked at the time, and it was 9.58, two minutes before the bells ring in this space. I realized this is exactly how I feel before I lead worship. I stayed with the feeling and realized that I feel spiritually connected to what happens in this room at 10 a.m., no matter where I am, even if I'm not present. Often pastors are called shepherds. The UCC is holding a conference to support new clergy in their 20s and 30s, a category which I fall into called shepherding the shepherd. Although, I sometimes find the shepherding language for pastors a little problematic because it makes you, the congregation, into dumb animals wandering around in the wilderness and me into a savvy human leading you around so you don't die by wolf attack or falling off a cliff. I prefer God as my shepherd as all of our shepherds. Jesus as our shepherd, our guide, our teacher. I searched for a role of pastor relating to sheep that I like better, and I found the concept 
of the bellwether within the flock. Derived from Middle English, bellwether refers to the practice of placing a bell around the neck of a ram who leads the movement from within the flock so that the flock can be heard by the shepherd when not in sight. Think object permanence. The bellwether, the one whose role it is to hear the shepherd's voice, connected to the ringing of the bell, who leads the other sheep toward the shepherd, our God, our Savior. The concept of shepherd only works when we are all able to act as shepherds to one another. Our tradition, the United Church of Christ, embraces this concept that all believers are priests unto themselves, that we need no one person to mediate our relationship with the divine and with Christ. That it is our role to be shepherds, to each be priests to each other in the priesthood of all believers. Though in our passage today, Jesus is not only the shepherd, he is also the gate. Jesus says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The gatekeeper is opening the gate to let the sheep out, to liberate them. He calls his own sheep by name. This is a clue about how to be good enough shepherds to one another. I think about the importance of calling people by name today as the names were released this week of the 276 young women from Nigeria who were kidnapped from their school on April 15th. I can't think of a more important way to be shepherds to one another, to honor Mother's Day, than to stand with these grieving families and wrap their daughters in our prayers today. So today in your bulletin, you will find clipped to the insert in bright pink paper a name of one of the young women who was kidnapped. In the prayer after the offering, we will have an opportunity to pray and name this young woman aloud. I also invite you to take this name home, hold her close to your heart, and try with your prayers to ask our shepherding God to call her back home. We can pray for these young women and each other from images of Psalm 23. A Bible passage often read at funerals or beside grave or to a person nearing entry into the afterlife. Beautiful images of promise. Images of comfort and beauty are the promises of a shepherd God. We are promised that God will lead us into green pasture, plush fields of grass, to sleep, to relax, to be safe and happy, then beside still waters, to drink, to see the reflection of ourselves, our lives, our beautiful world, that whatever we have gone through, whatever we are carrying with us, our souls will be restored. And no matter where we go, no matter what happens to us, even in the darkest valley, God's love is with us. These are the promises of a shepherd God. 
When we have experiences of God's love or reminders, these experiences can radiate with us wherever we go. We can create these experiences of God's love for other people with our very presence, creating a sanctuary anywhere. We hear in Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy or beauty or kindness shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Literally, these spirits, essences of goodness, beauty, kindness, and mercy, the psalmist believes, will linger behind her, will guide his feet, will ensure wherever he goes that she will dwell in the house of the Lord. We are reminded as we imagine shepherding one another or being in a flock together, that Christ or God has no body on earth now but ours, no hands but ours. It is our eyes through which Christ's compassion look out into the world, our feet with which he must walk about doing good, our hands with which he blesses humanity, our voice with which forgiveness is spoken, and our hearts with which he now loves. The good enough shepherd is the one who makes the others feel they belong. Belong to themselves, belong to each other, belong to God. Even when God may not be visible. We have a deep human need to belong, to be known, for God to call us each by name. So it is our shepherding responsibility to know each other, to truly hear each other, to call one another by name, and to receive this too, to be known, to be heard, to be called by name. This validates our humanity. So let us go out into the world, allowing the gates of our heart to open, to free us, so that we can have life abundantly. Amen.